Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to VUX World, the practical voice podcast. You are joining us on Christmas Eve. This is a Christmas special episode and will be, in fact, the last episode of the year. So thank you, everyone tuning in now, spending Christmas Eve with us. And thank you to everyone who's been tuning in throughout the year. It's been an absolutely mesmerizing year. It's been so, so good. We've had so many interesting conversations. It's been absolutely immense. So we're going to close this one out in in real style. I'm joined, as always, by Dustin Coates. Dustin, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well, Ken. I'm going to get into the swing of saying this. I've been watching a lot of American films and, and all that kind of stuff, and that seems to be a greeting that a lot of Americans just tend to have in a, a, a natural conversation saying Merry Christmas. We don't say that enough in the UK, I don't think. No, no, what do you say? It's just like any other day. Now then. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> your Merry Christmas tends to sometimes creep in at the end of a conversation and like a shop after you've finished paying for your goods or something like that. Oh, Merry Christmas. Oh, yeah, Merry Christmas. Yeah. But it's not something that tends to feature <laughs> feature that much. Um, so we need to bring that back in. So I'm, I'm kicking off with Merry Christmases today. Uh, as we welcome our guest, our guest, if you are involved in the uh, voice industry and in the voice scene, no doubt you'll have come across our guest. If you were at the uh, Voice Summit in Newark uh, over the summer, she was speaking there. Lots and lots of experience in conversation design, and, and seven years worth of experience in conversation design. And the last two years spent specifically working in voice, worked on plenty of uh, skills and actions, and is a solid, uh, experienced person in this scene. Rebecca Evanhoe. Rebecca, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Thanks for the great intro. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending what will be, when this goes out, your Christmas Eve with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, it's absolutely, uh, as I say, yeah, so so it's been going really well this year so far, and thank you for joining us on Christmas Eve. We're going to talk a little bit today, um, we'll find out, Rebecca, more about yourself and more about your background and experience and some of the stuff that you've been working on, and then, boys and girls, what we're going to do is is we're still going to be focusing on, on some practical details, we'll weave in some, some practicalities throughout the discussion, but we're kind of going to do one of those things that you're probably hearing on plenty of other podcasts, and every second article you read, and you're probably going to come across something similar but we're going to do it with a little bit of a twist we're going to be looking back at 2018 and we're going to be thinking about some of the developments that have happened we're going to be talking about the highs and 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 some of the things that we've enjoyed um and the best moments of the year really and then we're going to be looking forward to 2019 to think what's the voice industry what does it have in store for 2019 and what should people be preparing for now as you're winding down to to chill out over christmas for a little while what do you need to be thinking of after the new year in 2019 so thank you dustin and rebecca for for joining us as ever and rebecca let's kick off then with with a little bit about yourself and a little bit about uh you know your experience in this industry and and what kind of things you've been working on in the past Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have worked, like you said, for the last seven years in the realm of conversation design. And I got my start working for a company that made um, sort of an educational conversation based game that trained students in the healthcare industry. So I got started in this, uh, they were almost like chatbots that were sort of pretending to be people. And I spent about five years working on all of the really fascinating problems that arose in that space. And then um, in the last two years, I've been working specifically on voice interactions, mostly on the Alexa side, but um, we've done a little bit of work on the Google side. And um, yeah, it's been a really exciting field to enter into because it's just changing. And if you're like me, and I assume like the two of you, if you love learning and you're curious, then we're all in a good industry because there's new stuff to learn every day. So it's been a really great um, experience. And um, yeah, there's lots of great people in this industry too. What is your, cause it's unusual because it's fairly, it's, 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 well, some people would argue that it's not new at all and that the conversation design and, and voice technology and all this kind of stuff has been around for a long, long time, but it mm-hmm. is fairly it's not common to speak to someone who's been working within that field full time for a decent length of time. There's a lot of hobbyists who've been doing it for a while, but to be to have the experience of working full time, even two two years working purely full time on voice design, it's 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 fairly a, a rare kind of breed at this moment. Would you say that's fair in summing up where we are in in, in the industry? 
Yeah, yeah, it is an interesting thing. And I often refer to it as a new field, even though we know that um, people, I mean, this this field has a has a 30 or 40, I mean, it depends on where you set the beginning at, but um, there are people in this industry who have been working in, in the realm of conversation design for several decades. Um, and a lot of those people got started in, as, as you probably know, in the IVR sort of phone conversation realm. Um, so this this new stuff um, definitely has deep roots in that. Um, yeah, I do. I guess what I observe most is that being a voice user interface or VUI designer, as we say, is a very high demand position because of what you're saying. There aren't that many people around who have more than a few years experience in in this field. Um, but lots of people are getting experience on the job. And that's really interesting to me. It's like there are, my understanding is that there are graduate programs or different programs that are starting to incorporate curriculum around voice design and conversation design. But um, I don't, th- this could exist, but I don't think there are many if, if they do exist, but there aren't any like specialized programs or tracks that, focus specifically on on this realm of, of you know this new sort of uh, invisible interface design or or you know voice interface so um, all the people who are entering in are getting here through a pathway that's not specifically through school um, so I I myself have a writing background I know people with screenwriting backgrounds there's lots of linguists who enter in the field people come in here through like sort of UX uh, research or design pathways. So, um, yeah, most people arrive here through some sort of interesting, uh, uh, meandering, um, pathway. And, and so we bring, you know, voice designers bring in experience from a lot of different fields. Mm. There's, there's, it's interesting you say that because I've been speaking to, um, one of the, uh, colleges in, in London recently and they're, they're bringing in, um, it's not, it's not the course, but part of the course. It's in advertising, and they're wanting to do um, incorporate more voice into that. So you know, helping the students understand uh, how the this kind of uh, new kind of devices and new ways of interacting with technology, how that could potentially affect advertising and marketing in, in the future. So I can see what you're saying in terms of it. It seems to potentially be bubbling around in education, but it's not. It's not kind of widespread, is it? And it's interesting as well, saying that your background is in writing so we had uh, Brian Bauman and uh, Alana Shalowitz on the show a few months back and uh, Brian's background was all in playwriting and that's one of the things that they were saying as well is it's fairly common for people to come from a writing background and then you mentioned there that some people are coming from a user experience background so I'm interested in your thoughts in terms of what what does it give you coming from a writing background going into VUI design? What would be different about a writer coming into the position versus a UX designer coming into the position? Mm, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think that the when you get formal education in writing, it usually means that you're pretty obsessed with language and uh, you start to get a sense as you work with writing and editing your work and immersing yourself in the work of other people, um, you start to get really well versed in how adaptable language is and how you can edit it and focus messages with specific constraints. And that is what voice design is all about, right? Like there are all these different um, things that might affect how you write something. You, You know, if you're considering like, your user's education level or your user's, um, you know, you would consider things like cognitive load, like how how much sort of processing, how much brain space you're taking up for your user. Um, those are examples of things that would, that would influence things like what words you choose, how long your sentences are, the order of information you put the words in your sentence, Um, And so people who have writing backgrounds are really obsessed with that stuff. Um, We're also obsessed with things like rhythm. How does something sound when you read it aloud? Or, you know, like, does it develop a nice um, flow to it? So people who enter from a writing background often have those kinds of obsessive um, 
I think, positively obsessive uh, things that, that we like to dig into. But of course, there's, there's a larger, so, so the things I've said so far have to do with writing on more of a sentence level. But when you come from a writing background, you're also thinking about the flow of a conversation. So um, either fiction writers or screenwriters um, think a lot about dialogue and how a conversation can go and what information each each you know, speaker in the conversation can offer to make the conversation move faster or slower. So those are the sorts of things that I think make, uh, are really essential to voice design. And that's, you know, the, the people interested in those sorts of things are writers and screenwriters. So it, when writers and screenwriters find this kind of work, it can be really satisfying because these are the kinds of things that we care about and think about a lot. Mm. And it's almost as though coming from a writing background, although you wouldn't necessarily think of writing itself as a form of user experience, although there is now job roles, the the relatively new job roles, but UX writers are, are a thing kind of thing. So people who are focused on crafting the written word to provide a, a decent user experience. But some of the things you're saying there around coming from a writing background and, and being focused on making things you know concise or making things flow well or sound well, all of that is, is, although it's the art of writing, essentially, it's also, that is the user experience as well, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at the core of, of user experience is um, empathy, I think, trying to figure out how people besides yourself are understanding something, how they're experience something. And I think that same core is present in um, fiction writing and screenwriting, like that, that core of empathy is also what writers are trying to do. Um, understand how the world works, how humans are experiencing it the same or differently. So um, I, I do think that that is the common interest and goal between like user experience folks who come from that um, space and, and people who come from a more writing space. Mm. And you've worked on on a number of different skills at Morbiquity and, and actions and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, some of them don't sound necessarily as though they would have what you would call conversational, well, it depends what you term conversational design, but some of them you mentioned around banking and, and uh, tickets and things like that. I would, in my mind, I would kind of think of those as more as kind of quick kind of get stuff over and done with i want to get i want to get an answer how do you sort of is there still an element of conversation design in those kind of apps where people want to go in there and, and get a piece of information and and either do something with it or be on their way is there still an element of conversation design that needs to go into those kind of product, product productivity apps mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question um i would say that absolutely that that um thinking about some of the pillars of conversation design are essential even when you're trying to make an interaction that's you know the user asks a question and they get an answer so um, an example of a skill that we worked on was um, a movie ticket buying skill um, and mobiquity um, partnered with adam tickets to make this adam tickets voice skill where you can um, just buy tickets using your alexa and it was one of the first voice skills that used Amazon pay. So once you set up Amazon pay, all you have to do is say the, you know, the tickets, how, you know, what movie you want to see and pick a time and, and some of these basic things. So on its face, that seems very transactional. Um, and, and it is right. It should be the, the premise is I either know information. I might know the movie I want to see, or I might need help browsing a little to find the movie I want to see. And from there, I just need to enter a few key pieces of information, like picking a time, number of tickets I want, confirm the payment amount. Um, but in every single step of that, you're thinking about um, how much information you want the user to think about or confirm at a time um, and how you want to confirm, right? So for example, a decision that I had to make as a, as a designer involved in this skill was, um, Sometimes, so there are many things that you have to confirm when you're buying a movie ticket. The name of the movie, the theater, the time, 
um, the number of tickets and whether you want adult child tickets, things like that. So this conversation is already several turns um, or, you know, several, several back and forth moments between you and Alexa. Um, you can imagine if you do what's called explicit confirmation where like, you know, I might say, oh, I want to go see um, Lady Bird. And if Alexa says, I thought I heard you say Lady Bird, is that right? And I say, yes. If Alexa asks you to confirm everything you said at every step, that doubles the length of the conversation. Um, if you do something called implicit um, confirmation, um, that's where Alexa repeats it back and then asks you the next question. So that would sound more like, uh, I would say, oh, I want to go see Lady Bird. And Alexa might say, okay, you want to see Lady Bird. I have showings at two, four, and six. So Alexa didn't ask me to confirm, but she repeated it back to me so I feel confident that she heard me correctly. Um, so at every step we had to, set to decide things like, were we going to use explicit or implicit confirmation? Uh, and those are those decisions are very much in the realm of of voice design. And then, of course, you also want to um, even in a in a really in a simpler interaction where you ask a question and Alexa answers, you're looking really closely at the dialogue and the order of information and how much information you're offering. So even in the example of Alexa, what's the weather? The team involved with with designing that interaction had to figure out, um, how much information they were going to offer every time. Do you want just the degrees? Do you want the rain chance? Do you also want the wind, the precipitation? So um, undergirding even a simple interaction like that is this concept of, of figuring out what the, what's the general user's goal in any conversation and at any moment. So it the best conversational design feels really simple and smooth and almost unremarkable, but undergirding a really simple moment is a lot of deep thinking. So sometimes the, the most streamlined interactions that take the least amount of time are the ones that took the most time to design and think through. Mm, that seems, sounds fairly similar with, <clears throat> with other modalities, doesn't it? So usually a website that is really plain and crisp that, that, does certain things, whether that's ticket buying or whatever, tends to be the one that's that's either the more complex behind the scenes in terms of how it's handling everything in the background, or or that takes the most kind of either debate or testing or all of that upfront work just to make it so simple. Which it's goes it's it's almost like it's that it's the old kind of saying of, of good design goes unnoticed, isn't it? Is that still? Would you say that that applies mm -hmm. in the voice space? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's the um it's the iceberg principle, right? Like you only want your users to see the very tip, but you know, 10 elevenths of, of the work should, should go unnoticed. And that's when you, when you're aiming for, you know, we, we use words like frictionless and seamless. And we're, when you're aiming for that kind of design, um, like you were saying, whether it's a voice medium, whether it's a visual medium, um, yeah, it takes the most the most effort to make the the easiest and smoothest interactions. And how many iterations are you going through when you're when you're planning these? You mentioned that uh, ten elevenths of the work should be unseen, uh, but what does that equate to for you? That's a great question. I mean. When I did work at Mobiquity, we worked for clients. And so, as you might imagine, um, budgets and timelines are finite. So those put you in a position where you have to limit your number of iterations just, um, you know, because, because of resources. Um, but generally, you would want to do enough user research with the client and and with whatever users you, you know, whatever research you budgeted for, whether it's interviewing customers who will be using it or you're doing research and figuring out what else other companies doing similar things are doing. Um, you want to do enough of that to be able to make a good hypothesis. And um, there's all kinds of simple testing you can do, whether it's table reads or building mock-up skills and programs like SaySpring. Um, 
you definitely want to test those as, as much as you can, like, like prototype, um, actually have, you know, talk to your actual users. Those sorts of things will kind of cut down churn when you start building. Um, building, in my experience, they, we usually only get one chance to build it. So that's why the uh, preliminary user research, we try to maximize as much as we can. Um, and in terms of specifically dialogue, like I do have a more concrete answer for dialogue. I usually say that we'll rewrite um, the dialogue between five and 10 times. And so first you're just sort of blocking out what your experience looks like. Um, second, you're going to, you're going to sort of go through and have more of an eye towards uh, improving your questions uh, making sure you're asking the questions that are going to yield the answers your users are supposed to be giving. Um, near the end, we usually do a branding pass to make sure that um, the voice of the the company that we're building something on behalf of, that their voice is, is present and that it aligns with um, their values and, and the personality, the persona they want to create. Um, and then we also do a lot of work around concision, just making sure that every sentence is, um, uses the clearest words in the clearest order and uses the, the fewest amount of words to, to get the job done. So, um, I mean, if I had a project I would get to work on for a year, I would probably, you know, build three different versions of it and test all of them and, um, you know, that would be really fun, but um, usually you do, it's more of a question of getting maximum iteration in, in the time allotted. Mm. And how do you, what's the process for, for handing it over then to, to the, the developers? Is it, are they involved in and collaborating throughout the dialogue design or do you do all of that research and testing and get it to a point where you feel as though you've got something that's well-rounded and, and uh, as finished a package as it can be in the time you have and then hand that over? How does it, how does it kind mm -hmm. of, how does it, how does that look? I think that's such a great question. I feel really passionately about it. Um, the sooner it's like the developer and the designer and even the QA person, if you can pull them in really early are very much a team. And the sooner you involve the developer, the better things are going to be. So typically at Mobiquity, and I think a lot of companies operate this way, we would meet extensively with the client and I would be involved in those meetings, um, figure out the needs, get a basic, you know, gather enough information to get the design hypothesis. And I would start talking to developers as I was developing the design. And so we would have several meetings where I would sort of say, okay, I want to walk you through the design hypothesis I'm building. And I want you to help me identify where there's going to be tech constraints, where there's inefficiencies, where we have to make decisions that we need the client to approve. And every developer I've worked with has great ideas that contribute to design. So it would be a major disservice to not involve them early. Um, and I think, so... And, and I love uh, working collaborative, collaboratively like that. So I think when a designer makes a design and then sort of throws it over the fence, I think that's when, when you get into trouble because I think devs are creative as well. Um, and they have a lot to contribute. And it's no fun to just sit down and be quiet and implement what you've been given. Uh, so... Um, yeah, I, I, th I think that doing involving devs as early as possible is, is really great. I'm assuming when, when something's just thrown over the fence, Dustin, that that raises more questions for you than it, than it answers. No, no, I love not being involved. It's, uh, it's really the, the greatest interaction is not being involved at all. Uh, I, I joke, but <laughs> no, I think, I think. Like, tell me nothing until the day I'm supposed to start coding. Please. Right. And then, then tell me exactly how to do it. That's that's the best part, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So, I mean, Dustin, as you know, it, it, it as a designer, I might say, okay, well, I think this is what the client wants. And based on best practices, this is the way I would like the conversation to go. And devs would easily come back and say, okay, we, we can either do it this way and use this slot and this, you know, build things this way and use this business logic 
or we can do it this way, but you kind of can't have both. Like there's a lot of compromise to be worked through in these things. Mm. And is this through formalized kind of review meetings or something like that? Or, or are you kind of working collaboratively in the open and you just call up people for 15, 20 minutes here and there? Is, is there a structure around that developer feedback or is it kind of very much just part of the design processes that you'll just bring people in here and there to, to clarify things and get ideas and, and all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always I've worked remotely most of the last well, all of the last couple of years. So, I mean, as a designer, I feel like it's my duty to to keep people informed. Um, so I, I think that it would be possible for me to just sort of design in a silo, but I don't think that's ever the way to get to the best design. So um I, it's sort of like you're describing Kane, where I would, you know, get to a certain point where I would know, okay, we've got some decisions to make here. I need to know some information before I can move forward with what I'm trying to design. So then I would call for like a 15, 20 minute meeting and walk them through a flow or a section of, of what I'm working on and get feedback. Um, and, um, we would use like sh like collaborative documentation. So we use like Google slides and spreadsheets and things. And um, that way, if the devs wanted to see what I was doing at any time, they could just look and see what the latest changes were, leave comments for me. Um, so not a super formal process unless the designer makes it so. I think in a lot of places, um, you can be as uncollaborative or as collaborative as, as you want. And I always make the time to, um, to loop everybody in on what I'm working on. Mm. And I, I caught the, um, the video that you did on the Alexa Twitch channel with uh, Memo Dorin, and mm -hmm. you were kind of talking about, I know that Amazon are keen on this kind of way of doing it, but I'm wondering whether you can shed some light for, for people who are looking at, you know, trying to, either who do it currently but might use the process map way of doing things in terms of decision A leads to here, decision B leads to there, and you follow the tree structure. But the thing that Amazon talked quite a lot on, uh, certainly on, on the Twitch channel and the conversation you were having with Memo was all around how the navigation should almost be flat. So it shouldn't really be a decision tree structure. I'm wondering whether you can explain a little bit about how you approach that from a, from a design perspective. How do you approach the structure of the, the voice app if it's not a tree-based decision tree, so to speak? Mm hmm. Yeah. So um, I do. That's such a good question. I do both things. I start in this realm of what over at over at Amazon, a lot of folks like Memo and Paul Cutsinger are calling situational design, where um, you start with a focus on a specific user, a specific context, maybe a specific environment, a specific goal and um, keep your initial design work focused on the conversation itself. So basically you're mapping out a situation like, okay, here's a first time user who is an Alexa pro. They talk to Alexa all the time. They have a really good sense of, of how to play around and find out what they can do. And they're opening a skill for the first time, but they know a lot about this and they're very comfortable with the platform. So you would write a script for your skill for that user. And then you might write a different script for a person who's a repeat user, but who is not very well versed in Alexa. And some users are very casual. Some users are very formal. Some users don't mind testing and trying and, and repeating themselves. And some users get really um, turned off by that. Some users like exploring, some users like menus. So, um, you kind of think about all these different scenarios and what the different features of your skill are and make little mini scripts, almost like you could think of them as like vignettes for these different people and these different moments with these different goals. Um, and that is a really good way to understand all the different things that your skill is going to need to do. Um, I also am a fan of, of making out flowcharts, um, not, not as the primary form of documentation, but almost as a thinking tool. Because when I make a flow, I'm thinking, it forces me to think about um, 
different pathways, different loops where a user might get stuck, where a user might want to go back. Um, so you, you, flowcharts help you think of the, the whole structure as a whole and what the different arms are and the different paths. And I do think it's valuable because then it gives you and your developer a common language to talk about like the, diff the business logic that's required at different points. Um, so yeah, I, I like to do both, but I think you do yourself a disservice if you don't start out with just making 20, 30 sample scripts of different scenarios, because that, that is how you keep your thinking rooted in the realm of, of human conversation. And that's how you keep the, the most ideal version of what you want um, in mind. So how do you weave in, or at which point do you weave in the kind of multimodal aspects of all this stuff? You know, if you're designing a multimodal skill that either has videos or imagery or whatever, at what point in time do you dis do you start thinking about that stuff? Do you do the conversation stuff first and then re you know go back over it and put the and think about the images, or are you thinking as you're going through the conversation design about the multimodal element? How does that kind of multimodal process work for you? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's the ideal way it can happen and then there's the real world way that it often happens where the real world way is often when a customer says look we've got these great assets images videos we'd love to weave them in um and that that's one way to go about it and it's um sometimes a good a good way to keep your focus keep the experience focused around good content it's a good way to stay in budget uh, the ideal way to do it is to um, think about moments in the interaction where visual is going to expedite the situation. Um, it's going to make things easier for your user. Um, it's going to offer them more information than they than is comfortable getting, you know, through through the ear. Um, and ideally, in either case, you want to start thinking about the holistic interaction from the beginning. Um, you don't want to make a voice pathway and then figure out where you're going to flash a card or where you can pop up a video. You do want to think about your user's goal, where a visual element would fit into that, and design the whole interaction around that, that concept. Um, that said, um, Amazon does currently require like like you can't um specifically have an experience that requires a visual element for the user to get through it, it has to be supplemental at this point um so you do need to think about a purely voice non-multimodal pathway but if if your if your visual components are actually adding value you should you should think about them from the beginning and how to get users to them quickly and efficiently Mm. That makes sense. Cool. Well, let's then have a think now about 2018. So it's been a phenomenal year for, for voice, 100%. It just seems to be, it's just gone crazy. I, it, literally, from starting the podcast in, in February, start of February, the first few months of the year was interesting but it seems as though maybe some point in the summer or this at least this is when i'd noticed it at some point in the summer it seemed to just take on a life of its own and and then there's branded interest and it's you know every day or so there's an article in forbes and business insider and all of these different publications are, are, are writing and covering um voice what looking back what has been the most memorable moment of 2018 for you, Rebecca? That's a fun, that's a really fun question. Um, I'm a big fan of, and, and I did do a little bit of collaborative design work on these, but I'm a big fan of uh, Alexa's blueprints where they're sort of templates, almost like little forms you can fill out to, so that any user can make their own skill by going to like blueprints.amazon.com, I think. Um, and then you can pick uh, a skill that you want to make and type in a few things and launch it. 
and end up with a, a custom skill that you made without any any dev work. I think those are really fun, and I think it's smart on Amazon's end to get everyone involved in. It's basically involving every user who wants to in conversation design. Um, and I think mm-hmm. I, I've been really excited about those, and they're very fun. Um, yeah, I'd be curious what you two think about your favorite development this what year. Do you think, what do you think, Dustin? What's been what's been your your highlight of of twenty eighteen? Oh man, that is hard to answer. It's it's hard to answer because it feels like it's just been coming nonstop over the past. <laughs> Uh, 12 plus months that it's hard sometimes to, to take a step back and say what of this year was the, the biggest i think really it's it's the totality of it is the totality of just everything coming sort of uh non-stop a uh, torrent of news a torrent of new features and torrents of new tools that really make this feel a lot more mature in 2018 than it felt in 2016 and certainly than in 2016 as well. So I think it's really not one thing by itself, which I admit is a bit of a cop out, but just everything all together. Wow. I think what I've, I think what, what was the, um, was it, I don't. Th- I don't know if, whether I want to say comical because of just how mad it was, but I don't know if it was necessarily comical because a lot of what was announced was was really good. But the event when Amazon launched like sixteen new devices and everything's got Alexa in it, and it was like, there you go, world. This is all of the different examples of where voice can be in your life, and it was almost like, you know, it's not smart speakers spe- specifically. It's anywhere and everywhere you can possibly be i think that was one of the the kind of i mean we've been talking about it on the podcast all all year we've been talking about how mobile's been really underrated and there's huge opportunities there we've been talking about you know voice being bigger than smart speakers and what that was really i found was it was amazon saying voice is, is going to be everywhere and he, here's a few examples of where we think it's going to be so i think that was a that was probably my my favorite moment and it was a bit comical as well i mean who thinks about putting a voice assistant into a microwave mm-hmm. the microwave got a, a little bit of teasing in the in the press because it's like it, everyone was like you just push a, a button like <laughs> it takes longer to use your voice but um there have been some good counter arguments to to that too, or some support for the microwave. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I liked the clock too. Yeah, oh, did you get? Have you got the clock? Is it out yet? The clock, anyway. No, I don't have the clock. I, I don't have it myself. I've seen videos. Somebody just posted a really good video on Twitter about like showing visually um, how it it shows your timers counting down on the clock. Ah. And with something like a timer, I think it's faster to look at an, a visual interface than actually, um, you know, say Alexa, how much time is left on my timer. So I thought I, I I'm a fan. I'm a clock fan, even <laughs> though it got some teasing too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, think it's, I think it's out now, Kane. I think they sent an email on Friday that it's available for purchase now. Ah, just in time for Christmas. Yeah, but not for us, only for the US. Sorry. Oh, nightmare. <laughs> well, the thing I found funny about the clock was that it was it was almost as if you've put a clock there and then now whenever you want to ask for the time, you kind of don't it removes one use case away from the smart speaker because you can just stare and there's the clock and you just you don't have to ask the time anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the timers, the timer functionality is really is really the the thing that makes them yeah. useful. But it, it does force you to. It's a really great example of like, okay, as a designer, as anybody working on on these interactions, which takes more time, looking at something or asking for it. That that should be you know one of our key metrics, and when you're using voice and when you're using visual, and I think the clock the clock is maybe a, a good compass for us to look to. Mm. What was your favorite device, Dustin? Oh, my favorite device. Mm. Hands down, I have to say the Google Home Hub. It really is just a fantastic, fantastic device. Uh, Rebecca, have you picked one up? No, no, I don't have one yet. Yeah, so I I did the Black Friday. I got one for, for $99. It really is just the right size 
uh, it, it adds a lot to it. The speakers are really tinny, so I don't use it on its own, but what I use it is I actually pair it with a Google Home that sits right below it. And the nice thing there is if I just ask Google to play some music, I know what's playing at any given time. So it gives a sort of heads up display there. It's a, it's a fantastic device. Rebecca, what's your go-to device? Um, I primarily work with, um, at Mobiquity, I primarily work with the Lexus stuff. And so I would be like a, like an Echo Show user. That's kind of my, my go-to. Um, yeah, but I, it's one of my goals in the upcoming year to experiment with more devices because, um, that's fun, right? Like who doesn't love playing with new gadgets and mm. figuring out what new things you can do in your life. Mm. The the Echo Show Two is pretty it's pretty good. Have you have you seen the Echo? Have you got the Echo Show Two, Rebecca? No, I still have the old one, but I've I've seen the newer one because some some coworkers have it. Yeah, it it keeps improving, um, and I think Amazon is is moving more comfortably into like multimodal experiences whereas in the beginning they were a little bit more firmly voice first um yeah i think the thing that i agree with you dustin the home the google home is absolutely fantastic and there's even there's little tweaks in there that are slightly different to 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 the show as well that, that make the experience just generally more pleasant like if you ask it who's playing football at the weekend if i ask it for who are borough playing at the weekend then even just the graphics and it's there's a there's a, a stadium so sort of like crowd cheering backdrop to it and everything it's just a really nice kind of smart smart piece of kit but the show too the sound on the show too is really really good it's like got a real deep at low end. It's like a it's a really good uh, piece of kit for for the sound as well, which I wouldn't expect. Um, what about events then? You, I mean, Dustin, you've been around the world this year doing all kinds of different events. And Rebecca, I know you've been speaking out for you as well. Rebecca, first of all, what's been your kind of favorite event of of twenty eighteen? Um, I would say that the Voice Summit in in Newark was really special um, because it's. Uh, I'm, I say this very positively and lovingly, but I'm surrounded by like people who are nerdy as me uh, about the same things that I'm nerdy about. And it was just like three days, not just of great um, presentations, but conversation with people who are just really excited about this. And we were there specifically to talk about voice. Um, and, and that was really wonderful. And I learned a ton and made all kinds of cool friends. It was, it was like summer camp. Um, for for grown up, so I loved I loved that event, and I'm looking forward to it next year. Nice. What about you, Justin? Uh, what was my favorite event in 2018? Mm. Uh, I would probably have to say it was reinvent. Uh, it's it's definitely fresher in mind. Uh, I've started thinking about the event, like you mentioned. I went to a number of events in 2018. Uh, we'll be at the Alexa conference in 2019 if, if anyone's there as well, and. Uh, reInvent really stands out just for the professionalism of how they put it together and how much I learned there. The voice summit was interesting. It was great to get to meet with people. But in terms of just the amount of knowledge attained during the time, uh, reInvent really was just hands down. Mm. Nice. And what about, what about, people so you, you've been to a lot of events both of you met you know lots of interesting people over the last year for people who are listening to, to the podcast um you know it could i'm sure that there's i mean we've had loads of interesting people on the podcast uh, over the years being absolutely immense but who kind of stands out to you both on in the voice industry as as you know someone who you've seen at an event or or what have you someone who who the listeners of this podcast should certainly go and check out rebecca what about you who, who's the person who you would advise listeners on this podcast to, to go on to go and check out um i so i'm like oh there's so many amazing people who have taught me so much um but the person that i am really supportive of her work and that that i've just been in awe of um i haven't met her um her name is erica hall and she is, uh, I think, the founder of Mule Design. She wrote an awesome book this year called Conversational Design. And 
everyone who's a designer of any kind should read it. it it's sort of, she's sort of looking for, uh, dis- she's discussing like what is, what is true and good and instinctual about the way that humans are already conversing with each other. And how can we return to those touch points in, in any form of design, not just, you know, a uh, voice design or chat bots, but really in any design medium. Um, it's an awesome book. And she also talks a lot about ethics of design, empathy, um, you know, sort of gender politics that are inherent um, in, in some design issues. So I follow her on Twitter and I loved her book and recommend it to everyone. Fantastic. What was the book? Conversa- Conversation Design by Erica Hall. Yes. Is that the one? And Erica's with, Erica's with a K. Yeah, E-R-I-K-A. Fantastic. I'll put that link in the show notes. And if any of you are our last minute Christmas shopping, then you can pick up a copy of that book. The link is in the show notes. Dustin, what about you? What, who's, who's, you know, you've been to a lot of events. You've obviously met a, a whole lot of people throughout the year. Who's who's the, the one person who you'd recommend VUX World listeners go and, go and check out? I I think I'm going to skip this question. There's really too many people out there. It's uh, too many interesting people. I know I will overlook somebody. Uh, you know, our backlog is a good place to certainly start. Uh, but I, I'm going to skip this question just because there's so many talented people that choosing just one would be would be too reductive. <laughs> you don't want to play favorites. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Okay then, what about 2019? Looking forward into into 2019, Rebecca. What are you looking forward to in 2019, and what are you kind of anticipating will happen? Either either from a design perspective, in, in trends and things like that. Let's start with that. Yeah, let's 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 start with design trends for 2019 when it comes to voice. What what are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, there's going to be all kinds of looking back in the two years that I've worked with some of these platforms, so many constraints that we had in the beginning are now omitted. They've been lifted. They've been, they're gone. So like a lot of our barriers are are getting removed and I think that will continue to happen. Um, The trend that I'm most interested in is um, there's a lot of talk about ethics and, you know, how to make our designs as free from bias as possible, as conscious of bias as possible, as accessible to all different kinds of of people as possible. And um, there have been people who are talking, who have been talking about this for years. And the, the voice of this to me gets more and more amplified every year because I think it's at the core, like if the core of design is empathy, then we need to be really conscious about how to empathize with as many different types of people with as many different goals as we can and uh, and understand deeply the context of people who are different from us. Um, And and of course, um, something that I talk about a lot and others do as well is um, the role of, of gender in in the realm of conversation like as as our experiences become more human it, it's forcing us to look at what it means to be human for better or worse and there are all kinds of fascinating people writing and thinking about this and um, so I'm really looking forward to these conversations continuing to to grow and develop and deepen over the next year fantastic what about you Dustin 2019 what, what are you looking forward to what do you think is going to be some of the trends that we're going to see in 2019 yeah, so I'm not going to be as empathetic as, as Rebecca. I'll be a little more technically oriented. But I, I think I have maybe a prediction and, and maybe a hope. And I'm sure I'm going to be off the mark with both and we'll see something that I just didn't even think of, of at all. Uh, I think a prediction is more of these voice assistants being in more places, including more multimodal places. I think we'll see it a lot more in cars. I think we'll see it a lot more in sort of uh, sit back type of environments like your TV, right? Uh, I, th- I think, I hope that you'll see it in stores as well. Uh, I recently went to the um, 
the Amazon Go store and it was just a, a wild, wild experience, but they still had people there answering questions. So imagine if they brought Alexa in there as well uh, to answer questions of, oh, where where are the cheese puffs? Where's the, where are the salads? How do I, how do I pay? Oh, I just walk out. Or how does that work? Uh, that would be pretty interesting as well. I think a hope uh, for me, but largely for the community at large is uh, we started to figure out more and more how to monetize these things. I think this is a big hope uh, because without monetization, for better or worse, money makes the world go round. And we need to figure this out to continue having interest in this. Otherwise, uh, it goes the way of, of uh, what is it, second Second life is is that what it was? Yeah, uh, we we don't want that. So I think those are those are a want uh, and a hope. And again, I'm sure what actually happens will be something that we didn't even think about today. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us on the final episode of VUX World for 2018. Such an interesting episode that there's lots of insights in there around dialogue design and conversation design and, you know, plenty of highlights from 2018. And that's another it's an episode in the wait in that conversation design ethics. So thank you for for uh, for bringing that up for 2019. Yeah, it's been immense. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Kane and Dustin, for having this conversation. And I really look forward to us talking more in the coming year and I really look forward to listening to future episodes of the podcast in the coming year thank you so much and where can people reach you uh, online where can people follow the work that you're doing um, the best way to reach me is probably on Twitter um, or LinkedIn and my handle on Twitter is at R Evanho E-V-A-N H-O-E um, so you can find me there thank you so much uh, and Dustin thank you for the whole year I mean dedicating all of your time to coming and, and hosting the podcast and, and you know you've been a real real really important part of the podcast and all the feedback that, that I get directly there's always your name is mentioned all the time and you've been an absolute pleasure to work with over the last year so thank you so much for, for everything you've been doing for the yeah, well, it's been absolutely mint yeah Kane thanks for putting this together really looking forward to 2019 uh, you know like you mentioned here are people who have listened to the podcast and and to hear their feedback and to, to see that they like it and they're learning something from it. I'm excited for what we can do in 2019 as well and how we can continue putting this out there. It's going to be a big year. And thank you, boys and girls, everyone who's tuned in. Even if you this is your first episode, thank you so much for being a part of VUX World. And 2019 is going to be absolutely amazing. Merry Christmas, everybody. And until next time, which will be, uh, when will it be? It's going to be the week after the 7th. So you're talking probably 14th of January. I think the next one will be now. Uh, and we'll be back. 14th of January with more weekly and probably more than weekly uh, voice user experience design development and strategic insights to help you all on your voice journey so thank you all Merry Christmas and we'll see you in the new year